Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless as a sign of his coming and the end of the age jesus said there would be a falling away from the christian faith and false teachers would rise up as we read in matthew 24 10 and 11 and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray the bible tells us these false prophets will twist god's word as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Many traditional religions are trying to make progress toward being more inclusive of the LGBTQ plus community, but for some groups, it's been a very slow journey on that front. Today, Lisa introduces us to a pastor in California who wouldn't be welcome to preach in many American churches. Each player spins a spinner. Drew Stever says his life is pretty average. We play board games and we garden and we make art and we, have to remind our kids 12 times to pick up the socks in their bedroom. What? <laughs> he and his partner Hazel live in Southern California with their three kids and two dogs. Hazel always tells me like I'm her boor boring white guy. But you haven't always been a boring white guy. No, I haven't always been. <laughs> Jesus is asking the people around him, where do you stand? Stever is a transgender man and he's also an ordained minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Do we stand on the side of fear and hate? Or do we stand on the side of curiosity and awe? Some Christian denominations have evolved to be more inclusive of the LGBTQ plus community, but the acceptance of trans clergy has been much slower. According to Pew Research, the majority of Christians still feel whether a person is a man or a woman is determined by their sex assigned at birth. Do you believe that the Lutheran Church is a safe place for queer people? It is trying so hard. In 2015, the Lutheran Church ordained its first trans priest. Trans clergy also serve in other denominations, but most still forbid LGBTQ plus clergy. Because there are a lot of people who say that, according to the Bible, God made man mm. and woman, mm. and, and that couldn't be more clearly defined. Hmm. How do you respond to them? Genesis 127. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In Psalm 139, we learn that God fashions each one of us. For you form my inward parts. You cover me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God's creation of each individual must surely include his designation of gender. His wonderful work leaves no room for mistakes. No one is born with the wrong body. It's hard to relate it to modern day times because it wasn't written for 2024, it was written for then. As culture changes, the Bible tells us God never changes. Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isaiah 48 The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. When we read in, in the scripture that God created man and woman, yes, and God created everyone else as well. This false prophet just added to scripture. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God created everyone else as well. Pastor Drew is a good pastor, and I think he uh, focuses on Jesus' commands that we should love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. Many professing Christians 
justify sin by using Christ's commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as yourself means telling them the truth in love, not by condoning their sin. At Stever's home church, Hope Lutheran in Hollywood, congregants told us when he says all are welcome, he really means it. Pastor Drew just brings such a light and life and just encapsulates everything we've always believed in in learning to really spread a message that is just love. Born and raised Lutheran in Minnesota's Twin Cities, growing up, Stever also went to Catholic school, attending church several days a week. Was there a certain point in your upbringing where you just didn't feel right in your body? I grew up female and in the female context, and I just never felt like that worked for me. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Throughout his childhood, Stever says he felt a lot of anger due to his gender dysphoria. There were definitely times where, I, like, if I can't exist in one way, I don't want to exist at all. I would just be better off not alive. Stever credits a homeroom teacher for first introducing him to a more compassionate Christian theology, accepting of everyone. This eventually helped him realize he was being called to become a pastor. You went into seminary as a woman. Mm -hmm. How did you come out of seminary? <laughs> Not a woman. <laughs> it was summer 2016, and leading up to the election, anti-trans rhetoric was ramping up. But Stever says he could no longer deny who he's always been. And there was a moment where I woke up in the morning and the words that came to my mind was, you don't have to be angry anymore. And I almost feel like God just took a snowball and just like threw it at my face. And so you think that voice was God? I think so, yeah. Satan hates mankind because we are created in God's image. He is sowing confusion in the minds of our children. And he is busy in these last days devouring those who are not steadfast in the faith, as we read in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 11. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. But after Stever transitioned, he began receiving hate, mostly online. Do you have concerns about going public in this way? I mean, yeah, I have concerns. Um, my family's safety is probably my top priority. And I believe that for those who need to hear, we'll hear. Folks want to just cookie cutter everything. Stever's spouse, Hazel, who is also a Lutheran pastor, knows firsthand the discrimination many can face in church. There's a lot of people in the Christian faith who don't even believe women can be pastors. Scripture is both explicitly and implicitly clear that women are not to serve as pastors. There are a number of observable and behavioral requirements for pastors listed in 1 Timothy and Titus, one of which is being a man. In violation of any of these requirements disqualifies a woman from the role of pastor. Women teaching men and women teaching false doctrine are highly correlated. In other words, if a woman teaches men, you can just about take it to the bank that she also teaches false doctrine. If a woman has such disregard for sound doctrine in that she is not allowed to be a pastor, then how can she be trusted with the holy word of God? She can't. So the bottom line is, nobody should be attending a church pastored by a woman. And you two are kind of a double whammy. I know. <laughs> I know. We don't mean to be. We're no. actually really quite boring. Yeah. <laughs> and Stever plans to keep being boring. But along the way, he also hopes that just by being himself, he can help more people feel seen and safe in church. What do you say to those who may have felt burned by church and by religion? My first response is, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that the church missed you. I would say specifically to folks of color, to people living with disabilities, people who are LGBTQ, you are good. Nothing is wrong with you. You are so good. Romans 
3, 10 through 12. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. And you don't need the church to tell you that. Pastor Drew has had a pride flag hanging outside of Hope Lutheran, and shortly after we filmed there, someone ripped down the flag and damaged it. The flag, though, is back up, and he told us he is, quote, not deterred by one person's small worldview. The last days, church, will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay, and not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. This is what last day's Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3:14 through 22 And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church, a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and I salve, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved, or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. 
Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Israel's enemies opened fire overnight in what seemed to be a coordinated barrage to show Israel they're still standing. Israel fired into Beirut and across southern Lebanon in what the Israeli military described as extensive strikes on Hezbollah terror targets. Israel has been carrying out airstrikes right on the edges of the city of Tyre. We counted about 10 airstrikes just in that area. After a day of memorials for the 1,200 Israelis killed on October 7th, a year ago, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel is in a war to change the Middle East, with America at its side. It was the worst attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust, but uh, unlike the Holocaust, we fight back. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. And we're... Uh fighting like lions with uh, the support of the American government, the American people. All four presidential and vice presidential candidates attended events in solidarity with Israel. But on some college campuses, tensions mounted with demonstrations last night calling for an end to the Gaza war. On this day in particular, it's very difficult for the Jewish community. And in Gaza, a year after militants left from here to attack Israel, there is now devastation. Benjamin Netanyahu claims Israel has killed the man who was expected to take over as Lebanon's leader of Hezbollah. Hashem Safayadin was reportedly killed in an IDF strike in Beirut's southern suburbs last Thursday. Now, he was touted as the successor to Hassan Nasrallah, who was killed by Israel in a separate strike. Israel's Prime Minister says Hezbollah's leadership has been significantly depleted. We degraded Hezbollah's capabilities. We took out thousands of terrorists, including Nasrallah himself, and Nasrallah's replacement, and the replacement of his replacement. Today, Hezbollah is weaker than it's been for many, many years. Now you, the Lebanese people, you stand at a significant crossroads. It is your choice. You can now take back your country. You can return it to a path of peace and prosperity. If you don't, Hezbollah will continue to try to fight Israel from densely populated areas at your expense. Israel has maintained its airstrikes on targets in Lebanon. It claims it's targeting Hezbollah and attempting to minimize civilian casualties. On the verge of an all-out war in Lebanon with already devastating consequences. But there is still time to stop. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet, for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. North Korea has denounced the South Korean president for his recent warning against the regime during the Armed Forces Day speech. Its leader Kim Jong-un also threatened to make use of any force, including nuclear weapons, if the regime's sovereignty is breached. An abnormal man and a puppet. That is what North Korean leader Kim Jong-un called South Korean President Yoon suk yeol during his visit to a training base of the North's Special Operation Units on Wednesday. According to the North state-run Korean Central News Agency, Kim said, quote, Puppet Yoon suk yeol gave a long-winded speech full of anti-North sentiment 
and based on how he boasted of an overwhelming military response at the doorstep of a state possessing nuclear weapons, one gets to question whether he is a person of sound mind. This is the first time in about two years that Kim has strongly criticized Yoon without addressing him as president. Kim's remarks come after Yoon delivered a speech during Tuesday's Armed Forces Day ceremony, where he stated Pyongyang would face the end of its regime should it try to use nuclear weapons, warning of a resolute and overwhelming response from the South Korea-U.S. alliance. Kim also described North Korea as a nuclear-armed state and a nuclear power, adding that if U.S. and South Korea alliance intrudes the regime's sovereignty, it will not hesitate to deploy all disposable offensive forces, including nuclear weapons. Meanwhile, the defense ministry called Kim's remarks absolutely unacceptable and added that Pyongyang would not be able to gain anything from developing nuclear missiles. Saying that any nuclear provocation will lead to the end of regime, the ministry urged the North to stop all actions that threaten peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. Firefighters are attempting to control a large blaze currently engulfing an oil depot in Russian-occupied Crimea, Kyiv officials stated. Ukrainian armed forces confirmed it launched missiles on the region's largest oil depot to strategically hit fuel used by Moscow. Measures to undermine the military and economic potential of the Russian Federation continue, it said in a statement. Meanwhile, Russian missiles hit multiple Ukrainian regions, killing four and wounding dozens. The Ukrainian Air Force posted on social media platform Telegram that Russia fired ballistic and guided air missiles upon several areas, including the Sumy, Kharkiv and Kyiv regions on Monday. Luke, 2125. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. These displaced Haitians are awaiting food handouts after being driven from their homes by gang violence. Members of the Grand Griff gang stormed through their town of Pont Sondé last week, killing at least 70 people and forcing over 6,000 residents to flee with few belongings. Many of them came to the nearby city of Saint Mark. I lost many, many relatives, says this woman displaced by the gang attack. Nieces, cousins, aunts, uncles, they're all dead. They were buried without a funeral. The massacre on Thursday was one of the deadliest gang attacks the Caribbean nation has seen in recent years. The St. Nicholas Hospital in St. Mark treated some of the victims. One of them is Tetralith Charles, who says he narrowly escaped death. As the gang member approached me, he didn't point the barrel at me. The gun was facing the ground. I believe in God. I prayed as he tried to fire. It didn't work. Grand Griff gang leader Luxon Ilan took responsibility for the massacre, saying it was in retaliation for civilians remaining passive, while police and vigilante groups killed his soldiers. Haitian gangs outgun and outnumber the national police force, and they've grown in power as the government has weakened. Promised international support still lags, and nearby nations have deported migrants back to the country. On Monday, the head of a rotating presidency that is running the country said he would not ratify the handover to the man in line to take over from him, citing unresolved corruption accusations against three other council members. The break creates fresh uncertainty in the aftermath of the massacre. The council was formed to replace the government of former Prime Minister Ariel Henry, who was forced to step down amid gang conflicts that have killed thousands and forced over 700,000 people from their homes. Opposition supporters in Albania violently clashed with police during a protest, demanding their government be replaced by a caretaker cabinet before next year's parliamentary election. The conservative opposition have in the past accused Albanian Prime Minister Edi Rama's socialists of corruption, voter manipulation and usurping powers of the country's judiciary. They have staged sometimes violent protests against the government since 2013. After a colleague was convicted of slander and imprisoned in a case they consider politically motivated, 
The Democratic Party of former Prime Minister Sali Berisha has been holding protests outside the Albanian parliament for the last week. Both the US and European Union have urged opposition to resume dialogue with the government, saying that violence won't help the country integrate with the 27-nation EU bloc. Later this month, Tirana will start discussion with the EU on how the country aligns with the bloc's stances on rule of law, democratic institutions and the fight against corruption. After widely disputed presidential elections, protesters opposed to the presidency of Nicolas Maduro once again took to the streets of Caracas. Most of the international community has refused to accept Maduro's win without a detailed vote breakdown, which has not been forthcoming. We are here on our feet. We will not give up. The Venezuelan workers and their families will continue to fight for their freedom. Meanwhile, supporters of the ruling party joined another large demonstration, with the president of the National Assembly deriding the opposition protesters. Today, what you saw was the demonstration of what they are. A desert, a non-existence, a sadness. Former opposition candidate Edmundo Gonzalez left Venezuela this month for asylum in Spain after spending weeks in hiding. On Saturday, he greeted demonstrators and Venezuelan expatriates gathered in Madrid, flanked by heightened security. Dozens of opposition leaders have been arrested since the contested election, along with more than 2,400 Venezuelans accused of terrorism for allegedly taking part in protests. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 through 12. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Luke 21-25 and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. All along Florida's Gulf Coast, the race to escape is on. Residents filling sandbags, boarding up windows, and trying to clear debris that Hurricane Helene left behind. With up to 15 feet of storm surge possible, state officials are preparing for the largest evacuation since Hurricane Irma in 2017. Freeways already gridlocked for miles. Tampa's mayor with this blunt warning. If you choose to stay in one of those evacuation areas, you're gonna die. Tampa resident Jana Thatch and her family taking no chances after Helene's storm surge threatened her home. My kids can't unsee what happened last time and I don't want that to be another experience for them. Officials are most concerned about neighborhoods like this one, Madera Beach near Tampa, because of all the debris that's piled up. What the storm surge won't push into these homes could be lifted up by those hurricane force winds and become dangerous projectiles. Milton's winds reaching up to 180 miles per hour. The Cat 4 hurricane visible from the International Space Station as it moves across the Gulf of Mexico. 
On NBC6 South Florida, veteran meteorologist John Morales emotional at the storm's increasing threat. In neighborhoods devastated by Hurricane Helene, residents like Abby Lewis are trying to keep it together as they try to escape this relentless hurricane season. I haven't uh, allowed myself to kind of take in the emotional aspect. Saving just a few precious mementos. You know, I guess a good moment. But you got to keep it together. <laughs> and no time to grieve what's been lost. Do you have any idea what you're going to come back home to? Well, it's all already gone. It's a uh, lot of us not knowing where we'll go. Psalm 917. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. This has been Bolivia's worst ever fire season. That's according to new figures released on Monday from an NGO called Tierra Foundation. They show wildfires have scorched about 25 million acres this year, mostly in the country's tropical east. That's an area roughly the same size as Iceland or Cuba, equivalent to nearly 19 million American football fields. There have been over 82,000 active fire outbreaks in Bolivia this year, up until October 6th, according to data from Brazil's NP Space Agency. One of the NGO's researchers said the fires are a disaster of an unprecedented magnitude in the country. Last week, Bolivia's government declared a national disaster. The hardest hit area is Santa Cruz. Around 17 million acres have burned in the wealthy farming region in the country's eastern lowlands near Brazil. Scientists say that while most fires are set by humans, recent hot and dry conditions from fossil fuel-driven climate change are helping fires spread more quickly. They've also been exacerbated by drought and land clearances linked to booming cattle and grain production. South America has been hit by a series of heat waves since last year. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, 
believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. See, call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.